Here we go. We're going to finish it. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm trying. Dave had a megaphone and threw it. He reminded the crowd to stay behind the barriers that had been erected. This is a big tree, folks, he said, and when it goes, we don't want anyone else going with it. Bongo, I said in a voice that only she could hear. You need to get to a safe place. You heard him. I'm a big tree. You don't want to be in the way when I fall. I'm not going anywhere, she replied in a stubborn whisper. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine, but I'm staying with you, Red, and that's final. Good friends support you through those tough times. Dave turned to his workers. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Please, Bongo, I said softly but urgently. The saw moved closer. I waited, expecting to hear the painful roar of the chainsaw engine. Instead, a small but intense sound filled the air, something like a puppy growl mixed with a kitten hiss. It was a baby possum. Darting through the huge crowd across the muddy lawn, past Dave and his crew, around the massive saw beneath the stump grinder, and finally, triumphantly, up my trunk was none other than Flashlight. He climbed straight to his former hollow and settled there, his tiny head poking out. He was panting and trembling and hiccuping, but he did not seem to be in any danger whatsoever of fainting. Wow, impressive flashlight. I missed you, Red, he said in a voice so small that only Bongo and I could hear. Hold off on that saw, Dave yelled. Some dang animal just ran up the trunk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Moving the pillow. Bongo popped out of her hollow. Flash, she hissed. You can't be here. It's dangerous. They're about to, you know. You're here, Flash pointed out. Across the grass streaked hairy spiders with her other babies trailing. She went straight to the possum hollow where she proceeded to scold Flash as she snuggled him close. In the sky, little Harold suddenly appeared, frantically flapping his wings like a fuzzy butterfly. Agnes and the rest of her broad followed. They settled into their old home as if they'd never left. Bongo moved to home plate to make room for the owls. The ewes came next, trotting across the lawn. Last to join the group was the skunk family who quickly scrambled up my trunk. Seven possums, four raccoons, five owls, and six skunks had waddled, scooted, dashed, and fluttered from their various homes just to see me off. My residents, my friends. The crowd was delighted. People applauded. They cheered. They laughed. Francesca, straining to get a look, accidentally let go of the kitten's leashes, allowing Lewis and Clark to escape. They ran straight to me, clambering up my trunk to join the gang. It wasn't all perfection. The babies and parents were grumbling, but softly enough that none of them, none of the humans could hear. Ouch, muttered hot buttered popcorn. Your tail is in my mouth, cried one of the youths. You smell like skunk, someone complained. I am a skunk, came the reply. Mom, said Harold, should I be afraid of a cat? As a rule, yes, said Agnes, but this is a special circumstance. It took some effort, but eventually the entire group settled in together above the highest wishes. They gazed down calmly at the fascinated crowd below. One of the tree cutters took off his helmet and scratched his head. This just don't happen, he said to Dave. Those animals ought to be eating each other. It's some kind of crazy critter miracle, said another worker. He pulled out his smartphone. This is going on Facebook. Lots of other people seem to have the same idea. Cameras clicked away, ignoring the barricades. The reporters dashed over, microphones extended as if they were hoping to interview the animals. Bongo, always a bit of a ham, was happy to comply. Chip, please, she said to the microphone, waving beneath her. Look at them all. Even the kittens. Dave gestured helplessly at Francesca. What is up with the merengue lady? How are we supposed to cut this tree down? Francesca, wiping away tears, stood. She put her arms around. Oh, did I miss something? Oh, I didn't. Okay. She put her arms around Stephen and Samar. Slowly, they made their way back across the muddy grass. When she reached me, she pulled a bookmark from Bob's journal before handing the book to Stephen. It was a strip of cloth made of blue striped fabric, frayed and faded. Bob's wish. Carefully, Francesca tied it to the lowest branch, already crowded with wishes. She stared long and hard at the animals. Lewis and Clark purred happily. The crowd quieted. The only sound was the rustling of my leaves. 
Finally, Francesca spoke. Look, I don't do speeches. That's not my way. She patted my trunk. But here's the thing. Until today, I'd almost forgotten how important this old tree is to my family's story. And from the look of it, she pointed to the residents. It's important to a few other families as well. Many people smiled, a few laughed. I hate this word, Francesca continued, running her hand over the carved bark. Hate it. My great-great-grandmother Moave would have hated it just as much. Here in this neighborhood, we're better than this. She looked over at Samara's parents. We don't threaten people here. We welcome them. Francesca reached for Samara's hand. The tree is staying put, and I hope your family will, too. That night, many hours after the crowd had scattered, Samara slipped out the front door of the little blue house. Stephen, who'd been watching from his bedroom window, joined her moments later. They sat, silent beneath my wish-laden boughs. The slightest breath of wind sent the index cards fluttering like huge moths. Moonlight was everywhere. On the wishes, it was on the branches, on the down-headed owlets, and the upturned gazes of Stephen and Samara. How beautiful we all were, bathed by the soft and silver light. Do you think your family will stay here? Stephen asked, after everything that's happened. I don't know, said Samar. I hope so. The breeze kicked up, cards clattered, ribbons danced, a scrap of notebook paper loosely tied with red yarn to my lowest branch broke free. Samar snatched it as it swooped past. She squinted at the scribbling writing. Then she stood, carefully tying the paper back onto my branch. What was the wish for? Stephen asked. An invisible robot that does homework. Seems unlikely. True. Samara leaned against my trunk and smiled. But then, so does a talking tree. If this were a fairy tale, I'd tell you there was something magical about that wishing day. That the world changed and we all lived happily ever after. But this is real life. And real life, like a good garden, is messy. Some things have changed, some things haven't. Still, I'm optimistic. I'm feeling hopeful about the future. Samara's parents decided not to move, at least not for a while. Stephen and Samara have become good friends. Sometimes they do their homework at the base of my trunk. Their parents still don't talk to one another. I'm not sure they ever will. The police never found the boy who carved a leaf into my trunk, but a couple of weeks ago I saw him sauntering by. I pointed him out to Bongo. Let's just say she made a very large deposit that day. All my residents are back where they belong, safe in their hollows. Still, they argue sometimes, but they hadn't yet eaten one another. Francesca applied to the city to make me a heritage tree. That means I'm protected forever. She's also on a first-name basis with a local plumber who's learning to deal with my pushy roots. Lewis and Clark still haven't figured out how to walk on leashes. Bongo's made a new friend. His name is Harley Davidson. I suspect we have some crow newbies in the future. As for me, I promise Bongo I'll never be a butt, skin, butt, skin, a butt in the sky again. I told her that my meddling days are over. And yet, here we are, you and I. What can I say? I'm more talkative than most trees. Still, if you find yourself standing near a particularly friendly-looking tree in a particularly lucky-feeling day, it can't hurt to listen up. Trees can't tell jokes, but we can certainly tell stories. <gasps> oh, did you love it? I loved it. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, Catherine Applegate, she's my fave. So we read Ivan, Crenshaw, and Wish Tree, and I, I don't know. I don't know if Wish Tree trumps. I think Ivan's still number one, and then Wish Tree for me. I think that's the order that would go. Something about Ivan, I really like. But this was beautiful. I loved it. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and then you'll see what our next read aloud is next week. Bye.